Okay, we I think uh, let's start. Um, welcome to episode 11 of The Focus. Um, and we'll explain a little bit more about what it is um, as uh, in, in, the, in the next few minutes. Um, my name is Aldu, um, and we've got Aurea joining us uh, as well. We, uh, we started this uh, podcast series called The Focus, um, where we explore a specific topic and I'm going to ask Coria to introduce Davi, and then we will introduce what it is that we're talking about as adaptive oversight. All right, thank you very much, Aldo. Uh, today we have the um, honor of hosting uh, Davi. I um, met Davi um, almost seven years ago, I believe, and um, we, we found we have many things in, in common in the way we look at the, the world of work and the way we, uh, we are working towards nurturing excellent organizations. And I thought uh, this topic of adaptive oversight would be of, uh, of great interest to Davi. And um, uh, we're, we're very curious to hear uh, stories from his, his journeys. So, um, Davi, I invite you to, to tell us a bit about your, um, your journey. Thank you, Haria. Uh, certainly, we've known each other a while, and I see a whole bunch of familiar faces on the, uh, on the, on the list there. Uh, so I want to call out Cam and say, hey, Cam, it's been a while. Nice to see you, man. Um, the, the topic is interesting to me because I've spent a whole bunch of time in enterprises and I have seen over the years the desire to, I'm going to use this cynical air quotes, transform uh, via program uh, change into more flow-based organizations. And on, number, on a number of occasions, I've seen that get caught up in the inability to adapt for one critical dimension of the firm or another. Um, my professional background, just so for those of you who don't know me, is I've been a bank CIO or CTO in one way or another since the early 2000s. So that makes me feel real old. Probably shouldn't put it that way. <laughs> um, so I've experienced, I've experienced the, the oversight part of, of adaptive oversight in a number of different uh, forms over the years. Uh, what I haven't necessarily experienced is the adaptive part of adaptive oversight necessarily successfully. Uh, those firms that I've had the opportunity to grow, learn and lead in uh, ranged in size from 40,000 person banks, uh, where my remit was for teams of 2,000 odd engineers at a time, uh, and also very small ones where I had remits over six people. And the problems are shared in most cases across scale. Um, the solutions not necessarily, but certainly the symptoms are, are recognizable in all of those places. So thank you very much for having me. As you can tell, it's a topic I am interested in. So I look forward to our chat. Thank you very much, Darvi. Um, so many of you may not have heard about the term adaptive oversight, and we're just going to spend a few minutes just quickly explaining that, uh, and then we're going to jump into grilling Darvi a little bit about his experience and what he's learned uh, uh, on that journey. Now, Darvi, I started my IT career as well in the early 2000s, well, even before that, so I'm also feeling a bit old, I think, I guess. So... Um, just uh, moving on a bit from there, in my career and in Horia's career and everybody, uh, the more people we started talking uh, to found exactly the same type of phenomenon. And we've been, Horia and I and a, and a few other people have been starting to research that from early 2020 about what is this domain where we, where we always seem to find some form of friction or conflict between these new ways of working and those having the responsibility for overseeing initiatives. And we always notice that there's a, there's a, a point of friction there. Now, these two perspectives has got really quite diverging uh, uh, ends that they need to meet. And this is the domain that we're actually exploring is this tension that we find between people that wants to bring in new ways of working, new organization, new ways of organizing, new ways of 
whatever you want to call it, agility, whatever you want to put in that, so, as that side, and then the people that needs to actually make sure that the shareholders' money are spent in a responsible way or the taxpayers' money is spent in a, in a um, responsible way. So that's why we've come to call it adaptive oversight. Now, Horia will explain exactly why we come up with the term adaptive oversight and not stayed with lean governance. Right. So we like the term oversight for a number of reasons, um, not least of which the fact that oversight has two meanings. And one of those meanings is, is sometimes overlooked. <laughs> We have an oversight. We missed something. Yeah, <laughs> the usual um, understanding of oversight has to do with looking at things from above. I'm seeing from above. I'm overseeing something. So this necessity of seeing the big picture, uh, figuring out what's going on, uh, what is important to pay attention to, and noticing: Are we missing anything? Um, is actually crucial. Um, one amusing uh, fact that we came across in our research is that the um, US Marine Expeditionary Force has a set of flat ass rules, they call them. And one of these rules is called guardian angel. So guardian angel is, is this idea that wherever the Marine Expeditionary Force is, there will be a guardian angel. You don't know who that is, but there will be one. There will always be some badass marine somewhere that makes sure that you're never caught with your pants down, that you're always kind of scanning everywhere, seeing is there anything uh, right, not quite right, uh, uh, how are things um, uh, going, uh, basically. So oversight is absolutely essential. Um, it's important to, um, to notice uh, how are things going, are we missing anything, and the people engaged in the work usually cannot do this for themselves. That's why there will always be value in somebody else engaging with this kind of keep the broad picture uh, and supply um, insight. Yeah. Now, the second part um, and why we need a qualifier for oversight is that uh, in this day and age, there are so many different contexts. There are so many different situations that it would be unreasonable to expect that one single approach to oversight will solve it. Yeah, we're not in the world of the uh, Lord of the Rings when one ring will rule them all. Uh, we need adaptability. We need um, nuance. We need ability to figure out how do we approach oversight maybe a little bit differently? How do we tailor it to specific contexts? Uh, cookie cutters don't really work all that well, particularly uh, when you're trying to go at scale and you have a lot of complexity to contend with. So um, with that broad definition of adaptive oversight, um, I'll launch into um, asking Davi about um, what has your journey and experience taught you about adaptive oversight so far? Mm. Uh, yeah, that was a good explanation of your concept. Thank you. It's very, very enlightening. Um, the, uh, over the years, the friction that I have classically seen, uh, well, let's first talk about how classic governance comes about. Um, it's, a, it's a process that I often describe as being the process of progressive disappointment. <laughs> Is that we start with a process, uh, and our processes classically are, are quite carefully designed uh, with their handoffs and we can measure the frictions and we can we know what the handoffs are, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in, the, in the classic scientific management style. And then as things start going wrong in those, uh, we create controls and or observation points and or instruments at those failure points so that we can prevent those failures from recurring. Uh, sometimes we improve the processes. Sometimes we think that adding a control or oversight is uh, an improvement. And then over time, the accretion of those things bogs us down uh, with two things. The first thing that bogs us down with is very real friction, is that those processes that we carefully and scientifically designed um, become slower and slower and slower, and we get build up buildups of, of, of whip, et cetera, the classic symptoms. The second thing that happens is we get bogged down with the frame of mind that says that the way to address failure is through control. And we eventually get to a place where our 
our governance and or control that is meant to create uh, or create a sense of safety uh, is highly illusory because the distance between the actual work and the actual potential failure and the set of controls that we have become very familiar with and fond of is large. So the, so the controls actually no longer reflect the reality of the work. And there's a, I had the, the privilege of having this conversation once with ISACA, which is the, uh, the Association of, of Auditors uh, in New Zealand. And we walked through a classic, should we say waterfall style software delivery life cycle and examined the control points that are classically considered to be the tools by which we create governance, oversight, uh, a sense of a sense of uh, a sense of of knowing what's going on, and one by one examined the assumptions on which they were based, and one by one proved that the assumptions themselves are fallacious or wrong, uh, and the whole house of cards comes falling down once you've attacked one or two of those holy cows in the governance and control space, uh, and it's a very it's a very um, sobering time for control practitioners when they realize that a large portion of their career has been spent looking at a entirely ineffective um, and inappropriate control landscape. Now, and, and that's very confronting. Uh, and it's also why we often run into the, the friction as you described it between organizations that do need to govern because that, that is our role and our job, but also want to adopt agility at the same time and often the friction comes from the inability to bridge the fear gap that comes from the perceived lack of control of wanting to go to an iterative flow-based state. And that isn't, that isn't malicious. Um, it is that from the other side where we've traditionally pushed the need and the want to go to flow-based or agile-based organizations, we are not yet competent in articulating well the replacement for those controls that, that organizations have relied on for very, very long. And between the, the need for agility and the requirement for governance, there is a large chasm of fear, loathing, and things left unsaid. And the gap can only be filled through understanding the context of safety and the education in both ways as to how we could achieve that rather than sticking to the hard held opinions on both sides of the divide. Mm. So if you were to pick um, a top experience, um, what would be your, your greatest moments with oversight? <laughs> well, I can certainly tell you a whole bunch of, whole bunch of low ones. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why I'm trying to ask a difficult question. <laughs> the other yeah. one's too easy. <laughs> yeah, so one of my, one of my favorite experiences um, came about through being frustrated by this this perceived organization, organizational uh, friction or resistance, um, and doing that by by managing to to acknowledge this this knowledge gap, this experience gap, competence gap, if you will, uh, together with one of with one of our our audit partners, then became a second line risk partner, and agreeing to walk the road together um, of of us understanding what they needed the firm to protect itself from. And us understanding, or and us being able to articulate more clearly how our practices could achieve that. And the journey took must have taken about six months or so to the point where, uh, so basically two increments, if you will, um, of of experimentation and of learning and of teaching. And by the third increment, we had redefined the entire control set and remapped them to the outcomes that the firm needed and then made them visible within the practice, within the method, if you will, so that at any time, if a control person, a governance risk person was to walk past the boards, they could instantly recognize those controls on the boards. And the lesson for me here was once you've bridged the knowledge gap and you can, you can consistently articulate those controls in a way that is useful, not only to practitioners and not only to risk people, but to all stakeholders, you create the, the comfort and the, and the, and the, the look or the experience of competence. And this paid off in spades when eventually we had the opportunity to walk uh, group executives and the board, et cetera, uh, the other kind of board past our boards. And they could all stand in front of there and go, oh, gee, I can see you're addressing this risk. Tell me a little bit more about how that control works. And we went from, from fear, loathing and, 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 uh, in, and into a world of, of understanding and curiosity. And that's when, the, that's when the organizational healing started really, really quick, really fast. 
And to my knowledge, and it's, I've been away for a while, but to my knowledge, that practice is still alive and those boards still reflect in the flow of the work, the replacement controls or the replacement disciplines by which the organization knows that it is safe. So that'll be one of the highlights of, of my experiences along the way of, of creating, uh, and I'm very always careful with the concept of agile, should we call them adaptive teams or, or adaptable teams uh, in flow-based flow work? Uh, there have been a number of low lights, I can tell you that too, where yeah, sure. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in our own, uh, and again, I'll be, I'll be careful to use the word hubris because it does come across that way, right? It, it, it's almost a, almost a smug knowledge of how it should work and we can do it better, uh, which then sets you up for others to truly enjoy it when you don't. Uh, and I've seen that happen many times also. So the, the bridge to this, this fear and control gap has to be the mutual understanding of what everyone needs to achieve and the purposeful design of how we achieve that together. Mm. So um, at the moment, what keeps you curious um, in the realm of oversight? <laughs> I'm in a wonderful position at the moment where, I, where I've joined a firm that um, really has a, has a strong urge and a strong drive to get stuff done and no particular dogma in how which is, which is quite unusual. And we have the opportunity to, to create these, these dimensions from scratch. Uh, so what keeps me curious is, and, and, and interested is having, having the scars from many turns of doing it well and not so well, uh, of being able to pick the, the one or two practices at a time and inject them and test them and iterate through them to create a great, a great control landscape. And, and I, I see my, my colleague Andy Ward is on, is on the line as well. And uh, Andy is actually critical in this process as, as my head of, of, of control and governance um, in, in the process of iterating through what is it that we truly need rather than why don't we control everything we could possibly be scared of. Uh, so, that, so that keeps me interested. I'm a, I'm a great believer in the power, in the power of system but I'm an even greater believer in the power of power of emergent system that comes from intelligent and well-motivated people who know what the work is that needs to be done. That's awesome. Um, sorry, I'm just capturing notes here. Thank you. <laughs> um, it is recorded, Aldo. You can go back. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, okay, we, we, we're drawing out a system when we're interviewing and it's clearly not uh, working that well. So, um, Okay, so um, you did speak a bit of your struggles in oversight. Um, you, you, you spoke about some of your lowlights. So I'm going to ask a, a two, two prong question there. The first one is, is that what other struggles have you found on your journey? And what do you notice other organizations or teams uh, struggle with on, w w in oversight situations? Um. Yeah, yep, yep. All right. So one, one of my deepest held beliefs is that is that dogma is the enemy of our learning. And and what I see many organizations struggle with is is starting from a place of dogma, i.e., this is the method we're adopting, or this is the pattern we should aim for, or we've got to be Spotify or what, whatever it is that the departure point is. Because that blinds us, it, it, it blinds our ability to see the differences. And the ability to intelligently um, interpret the needs of our firm, our market, our customers, and our people, um, and alienates people really, really quickly. Um, and that's a struggle I see all the time. In fact, you know, I, I always, always resist the urge to visibly shudder when somebody says, "Hey, we're uh, we're adopting safe." I say, oh fuck! Really? <laughs> Excuse my language. Excuse my language. And, it, and it's not necessarily an indictment of safe. It's an indictment of the fact that someone has just admitted that they don't really want to observe, learn, iterate, um, and grow their own. Um, I believe that, that, uh, that, that canned methods um, are fantastically valuable as libraries of practice, mm. but they should never be the dictator of your pattern and of your implementation of what your working style needs to look like. So that's probably the, the key challenge that I see every time. Is the, is the need for the quick answer. Because mm. that's the other thing that leaders need to be critically aware of is that transformation in any shape is not something that you do over three months with a bunch of consultants. They can certainly help you. They bring lots of great knowledge to the table, but it's a thing that iterates and grows and should grow forever. So there isn't an end state. And that is a very hard thing for leaders to understand. Speaking of leaders, um, Davi, um, 
uh, we we found through the the research that we've been doing that it plays quite a critical role in how you approach and set up and execute on oversight. Um, mm. What have you noticed out there when it comes to the right types of leadership behaviors that supports this or detracts from effective oversight? Yep. Um, the behavior is certainly critically important um, and as important. Uh, and this is why probably one of my one of my repeat, repeated regrets in the in the transformation game, and you hear me making the air quotes as I say it, is is every time having not spent enough time on the education and preparation of our leaders in the first principles of how these strange and scary practices work. And the reason why that's important is that um, if if someone's a leader in any sense, uh, they've been successful at something that has had them get into that position where they're being trusted to lead a thing. You know, that's being a little bit obtuse, but you get where I'm going with that. Um, And as humans, we tend to fall back on those patterns that have got us here. And expecting people who have got to a place in a certain way to suddenly go to the next place in an entirely different way without spending the time to fundamentally educate them in the tools, techniques, philosophies of these potential new solutions uh, is actually us as us as coaches, um, us as change agents, failing them fundamentally. And I've found time and again that once, once one has taken the time to establish the safe and shared concepts, the safe and shared language with those leaders, the, their comfort with trying things differently grows exponentially, and they then start stepping into the potential of it and not resisting the urge or, or not resisting the work itself. And probably one of my favorite examples is I was on an executive team with a, with a, very, a very influential and very accomplished executive uh, who had come squarely from the School of Scientific Management. Um, and that's okay, because that's both a style and an education, um, and had a very clear need to know that there were boundaries to where, within which people could make decisions. So he had a very strong control gene. And it took us a long time, but we eventually came up with a language which became quite iconic. And anyone who was in the organization at the time will recognize it when I do it. But we came up with the language of bookends. Mm -hmm. And that was my colleague's way of being able to articulate his need for there to be nicely articulated boundaries within which people could operate. And once we established that as a common set of language, whenever we spoke about the concept of, of oversight or of governance or of control, we would refer to how do we create the bookends so that the books are wide enough apart so that everybody can play their part, but mm-hmm. that we're still comfortable that we know what the exceptions look like that we need to be alert to. So the behavior of, of, of leaders, especially transformation leaders, has to be highly inclusive, has to be, has to be absolutely focused on acknowledging where, where other leaders come from. Um, has to be very much to be in this space of servant leadership because I also firmly believe that as a transformation leader specifically, our job is to is to create the conditions within which the, the other leaders in the organization can be on the victory bus. It's not about us being on the victory bus. And that means that we have to come from the place of service and support, not from the place of, of reward and recognition necessarily. Uh, so it means that as transformation leaders, we have to come from a place where we are the we are the educators, also the learners, the supporters, the creators of the conditions for other leaders' success. Because, you know, the, no, nobody's in the business of transformation unless you run a transformation business, but the majority of businesses are not there. So the outcome, is not, the outcome we're after is not the transformation. The outcome we're after mm-hmm. is business and customer success. Yeah. And the custodians of business and customer success is not a change or a transformation program, is not a method. It's are we running a better business for our customers, our clients, and for everybody who has who is in it? Thank you, Darby. You spoke about fear earlier, and uh, I wanted to just uh, ring back some of the research that we found. And that fear is usually driven from a sense of loss, either fearing I'm losing something or fearing that um, uh, you know <laughs> I'm getting I'm losing control. Um, so. Um, what types of uh, manifestations of that fear and loss have you observed play out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Also, the the other dimension, of course, is that it's sometimes the fear of a loss of credibility, public credibility. 
um, and you do see them play out all the time. Um, often when you, when you work or are on senior executive teams, uh, what is striking in many of them is the lack of safety uh, in them, in that everybody is extremely worried about being, being put into the eyes as not being competent immediately at the strange new concept that's just been thrown on the table. Um, so you often see the, the passive aggressive behaviors come out um, because very few around tables like that are willing to say, hey, I actually know nothing about that. Can we spend some time and, and you can teach me a little bit so I can understand most people will sit back, well, not most people, that, that's not, not fair to many of my ex-colleagues and current. Um, mo many people would sit back and say, oh, no, that's, that sounds like hippie nonsense to me. Uh, certainly not something that a insert serious business here would do. So you get the, you get the passive, aggression, passive aggression, you get the overt aggression, uh, you get the, the, the plain threat the, hey, you know, we, we certainly can't operate in a place that doesn't have any control because we are a regulated organization. Um, and in the end, they all come back to the same point I made a little while ago is that we have to take the time to talk about stuff and these things a lot in safety so that people can become confident and, and comfortable in how they work and the potential for good oversight that they offer. Um, because those behaviors, those negative behaviors, you know, those are natural. That's the amygdala hijack stepping in right there. Uh, executives and leaders are all human, uh, you know. Uh, another one of my favorite topics is uh, there was a popular theme at a stage that um, agile organizations, it's agile organizations versus their leaders. You know, leadership must change this so that we can be agile, kind of, kind of carry on. And we must never forget that everybody is in the same, in the same worker, right? We have the same brand and the same customer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from uh, Andreas. Um, so I'm quoting, and Andreas, you can jump in at any time if you want to elaborate on your question. So traditionally, oversight slash governance often focuses on overseeing efficiency and stability or success, as you call it earlier. With adaptive oversight, uh, now ongoing changes also need to be overseen. Can you please comment on your experience balancing oversight for efficiency, our outcome slash success of and oversight and for change and yeah, that's, change. Yeah, that's a great question, Andreas, um, and 100% and true. And classically, if you were to look at uh, organizations that do separate those two contexts, i.e. The, the, con the context of change from the context of, should we call it BAU, business as usual, um, you do see two different sets of measures and you also see two different, very different sets of behaviors. Um, I am, I am, Absolutely not a fan of the of the split between run and change uh, in a firm. Uh, so I really enjoy the, if you will, product product led or type organization where uh, both change and everyday operation, i.e., efficiency, um, are actually the outcome of the same set of people. Uh, so you don't get the effect of you know we've built it, so we'll chuck it over the wall now. You must run it, uh, kind of thing. Uh, so I'm an absolute devotee of the of the DevOps style of working for engineering and of, of product ownership um, as the way in which we engage in new capability as well as current. Uh, there is there is some there is some great lit literature in this topic. I'm um, thinking here of Nicole Forsgren's uh, Accelerate and others in the in the in the domain that talk about the dimensions of metrication, i.e., what it is that we should measure, and how we balance those off against each other uh, within the same sets of people. I hope, I hope that answers the question. Oh, great yeah. question about energy yeah, from Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl, that's a great question. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the scars of many turns at this um, have, showed me, have showed me that the energy question is absolutely critical. Uh, let's, let's start off with what I've seen that is, that is, that is not so desirable um, is where we set a light our change agents, which is which is classic change uh, change methodology, is we find change agents, we turn them into change champions, we get them fired up, and we we send them into the into the fields to set the fields on fire, um, which is which is one way to do it. Uh, what I have observed over the years, though, because of the duration of transformation having no end, uh, those people eventually burn out, and they become. They become firstly exhausted, they become cynical, and they lose that initial strong faith that they had in this promised new world. So I've, 
I've, I've been working on the idea that instead of setting our, our change agents alight, we should just set them gently a smolder. I.e., we should take the we should take the time imperative for the change off the table, and rather focus on the what did we do better this time than we did last time, at every increment, and and rather adopt the one percent on one percent approach than than the transformation as a concept approach. And the framing that I like to use with my team is that every time we every time we talk about work, I like to hear them talk about three three dimensions. Uh, I call them product one, two, and three. You can think of them as a triangle of the product, of which product one is the actual work that we do, i.e. the product or the software or the thing, the widget. Product two is the way in which we do that work. This could be our method, it could be our practice, our tool chain, whatever that might be. And product three is the way we feel, act, um, and collaborate with each other along the way, i.e. our culture, our charters, our, our dynamic, if you will. And, and every time we talk about the work at every increment, what I want from teams is to hear what small change and or improvement have we made in each of those three dimensions? Because that then tells me that we're taking care of all the, all the bits, the underpinnings of the success of the incremental 1% on 1% approach. A long answer, but a great question. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, there is a, a question from David Morris. Uh, he says that he's interested in how you see audit and compliance changes when we shift from governance to adoptive oversight. Yeah, I saw David's question. I'm trying to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, mate. Um, yeah, and again, this is something we're working through with essentially a fresh slate now, which is very useful um, because what we've done is we've pulled our compliance uh, and risk teams close in the formulation of the, should we call it the, the proof points or artifacts that we critically need along the way to be able to do the auditing and the compliance. Uh, and separate those from the ones that we might classically have had just because of accretion over the years. And, and this comes down to simple things like when we define for ourselves a base template for, at the most granular level, a, a story in JIRA, what, 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 are, what, are the, what are the agendas that need to be satisfied from the use of the story as a definition of a piece of work, uh, which in the first instance has to support a team's flow, but what does the rest of the firm need from that in order to be able to do financial treatment or risk or audit or compliance and the like? And then to understand that basic and define it into the template. Because good compliance is compliance in the way that we do our work. And bad compliance is work that has to be done next to the work. So the idea is to actually bake in the dimensions into the definitions of our work that will satisfy the compliance and audit outcomes um, as the work is completed. Also finance and others, of course. So I hope that was that was useful, David. You got the thumbs up there. Um, so uh, a little bit earlier in the discussion, Darby, you spoke about uh, frameworks. Um, what in your thinking, what is your thinking about frameworks and how they influence the work of oversight uh, functions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, again, you know, I, I think I broke cover with my colors on frameworks a bit earlier. Um, <laughs> you, you, you're among friends, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no one should misunderstand um, that I don't believe that there is value in defined frameworks because there certainly is because frameworks are created by, by smart people trying to make sense of exactly the same problem sets we're talking about now. The danger of those frameworks isn't in the framework. It's in, in the, 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 the need to adopt them verbatim. And that's the same in, in compliance and governance is um, I much prefer that we teach and educate and understand first principles so that when we then look at a framework, that the framework makes sense um, as a collection of knowledge rather than as a thou shalt do it this way. And that's true for compliance and governance uh, and, and finance, by the way, also, because if, if smart finance people or risk people or auditors, compliance people know the first principles of the techniques, then they can apply their other profession or their real profession to how can those techniques satisfy the control objectives of the firm and design that into the work from first principles. And yes, there might well be an answer in any framework that might already be exist that is useful to us, but we need to be able to intelligently choose those rather than to just blindly adopt. Thank you very much, uh, Darvi. Um, 
We have one final question. I just want to check if there's anything. In just the... before you do, Aldo, I can. I see Charles Lusper is on the call. I can actually hear him laughing in the background. But he and I have had this conversation a hundred times. <laughs> Very good. Cool. Um, in in this space, in this domain, um, before we uh, talk a little bit about the some of the work that that we've done and and invite some comment uh, around that. Um, what else is it like that you what that you would like to share with us about this topic? I've, I've said the words um, first principles a couple of times, um, and I, I cannot overemphasize how important it is for for us as the custodians of of other organisations' future work to teach the first principles before we teach the method. Mm. Because it is easy. I mean, if we adopt the if we adopt the process of of or the approach of shuhari, right? It's quite easy to teach the shoe, uh, because the shoe, by definition, is meant to be really basic. But the shoe is a lot more powerful, and we can and we can certainly accelerate the move to the ha and the re if everyone understands how the shoe fits into the into the philosophy. Mm. Uh, otherwise, we're just teaching mechanical movements and motions. And when we do that, the mechanical motions become the dogma. And it becomes very hard for people to understand when we outgrow that dogma because they don't understand the first principles that brought us brought us to the shoe in the first place. Yeah, so we do we do stand up, so we're agile. So that's exactly correct. Well, we have we have Jira, so that must be good. You know. Thank you very much, Delvi. Um, I'm going to ask Horia to um, share uh, some of the work that we've done. Um, and we'll continue the, the discussion around that because it would really be great to get your insights around that. So, so <clears throat> this picture has evolved as we have uh, worked through various iterations of it, but at the moment we call that uh, our adaptive oversight galaxy view. And um, what, it, uh, what we've based it on is um, a set of a, a way of thinking that you can never really have one or the other. You're going to have to find some form of balance between um, the, uh, the, the, the new ways of working and the oversight function. There's always a compromise or a, a negotiation or an exploration that you need to make together. Um, so we, we've, we've gone uh, and um, came up with this picture, um, typical engineers uh, creating it instead of uh, uh, people that are, that, that's got a deeper artistic background. So um, it's pretty mechanical at this stage, but we have come up with this and it's based on the concept of polar uh, polarities or polarity thinking and how you would go about exploring polarities. Um, and when we did the research with the participants uh, in 2020, we stepped through those polarities and it was fascinating to see what is it that we came out with. And this is what we ended up with is, is we found that there were six main polarities in the research that we, that we came up with. The first one uh, set is this polarity between control and trust. And you've alluded to some of that uh, as well in the, in the earlier part of the chat. The next one is this polarity between people following or uh, insisting on the agile triangle and people following or insisting on the iron triangle. So there's a, there's a conflict uh, there. Then there's this, it was fascinating, it was actually a surprise for me to see that there's this thing about personal interest versus organizational purpose. We also found, you spoke about flow-based organizations and transitioning from um, flow-based, uh, from traditional uh, organizations into more flow-based organizations. There's quite a lot of things uh, where people are more focused on utilization versus optimizing flow. And then um, we had this, uh, we act, the explore and innovate versus maintain competent capability actually had three components and we struggled for a while to consolidate it into these specific, um, 
two polarities because the, uh, the, the three polarities were from an uh, oversight perspective, were from uh, practitioners or people uh, participating in the initiative and um, what's, who sits or what sits in the middle. So there were three perspectives that we tried to uh, collapse into this, this specific polarity. And then very lastly is the safety versus courage um, at the bottom there. Um, so those were the, 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 the six main um, frictions or fr areas of friction that we found. And now you'll notice that the picture has got uh, certain greens and, and um, yellows in there. Where that blue dot sits is where we've actually found the balance point in a specific context. So what we want to do when we go into organizations is talk about both those perspectives and actually find where for that context, that balancing point sit, and it would look totally different for another organization. Um, Horia, uh, I don't know if I've uh, given it justice, our galaxy view, um, can you, uh, have, what have I missed? Well, I don't think you've missed anything much. Uh, I'll just emphasize a few elements of this. So you see that we've shown that for every element here, like trust, there will be some values uh, that come along with trust. And there are some fears that trust uh, develops in people, right? It's like, oh, I've trusted these people too much. See, they've stabbed me in the back. Oh, I must have more control. Yeah. So the, the values of trust attract you towards it. Uh, the fears of trust push you away from it. And the same thing happens with control. So it's like an engine, right? It has two uh, poles of a magnet, and that kind of spins things around, keeps things moving uh, between control and trust. Because you could say there's good value in, um, in control, because I have clarity on what's going on and what's supposed to happen. But there are some fears in control. There are some fears that uh, if we overdo it with control, we're going to disengage people. Um, they're going to lose all sense of motivation and agency in, in doing things. So um, we're not suggesting that we're, there's, a, there's a simple, convenient resolution with all control or all trust. There has to be a balance of how much control, when is control too much control, and when is not enough control, and uh, how does trust play into that, right? Um, now, in terms of the Agile and Iron Triangle, some people may not be familiar with the uh, definitions we have for this. So uh, the Iron Triangle is the classic, uh, you must be on scope, on budget, on time, right? Um, and the more we insist on knowing all of those things, the more we figure out that uh, how do we know for a fact what the scope is supposed to be? So there are some challenges, some difficulties, some fears that come along with the Iron Triangle. And the Agile Triangle tries to resolve some of the difficulties of the uh, Iron Triangle by shifting focus a little bit and saying, you know what, um, rather than focusing on scope, why don't we focus instead on value? So why don't we go on value, on quality, within constraints. So in other words, we're not letting go of the Iron Triangle. We're embracing it as part of the consideration of balancing value with quality. And as a result, by then balancing the Iron Triangle constraints with the value and quality aspects of the Agile Triangle, you're likely to end up with a much more um, considerate and effective position for the evolution of your organization. Right now, um, where things get a little bit uh, tricky is uh, political um, activity, if you will, and this is where the um, uh, the clash between the, the the stated purpose of the organization and the personal interest of humans participating in organizations really uh, kicks into being. Because the fact is, whenever you say the name of an organization, we often forget, we delude ourselves about the fact that that's an illusion. There is no blah, insert name of your favorite organization here. There's no such thing. It's just a fiction that we maintain amongst ourselves for the convenience of saying, I work for blah. But the blah doesn't exist. There's no body of the blah that is in the world that we interact with. That 
concept, that fiction, is something that we create through our participation in this mutual storytelling. We tell ourselves the story of, oh, there's this blah thing, it's called um, a corporation or an organization of some sort, and we participate in this fashion. And by the way, why do you want to work for blah? Well, I want to work for blah because I get this benefit and I really enjoy that and I'm really keen to uh, do this and that. But if everybody just pulls for their own individual interests, then um, we're highly likely to end up in a kind of Brownian motion kind of thing where everything is kind of a, a nice soup of um, chaos and we don't achieve anything much together. So the clarity of what's our organizational purpose, that brings us all together. That aligns us very much like a laser right? We, we, we resonate with one another. We say, oh, that's a really great idea. You know what? I'm really passionate about it. So I'm willing to find a win-win because that's the thing. It's not about um, compromise. That's another critical um, sort of psychological insight here that adaptive oversight isn't about finding compromise. Adaptive oversight is about finding win-win. It's about finding synergy. It's about finding that, whoa, look at the hairs on the back of my neck, they're standing up. I'm kind of uh, amazed by something awesome. It's like, wow, I didn't even realize it by getting together this way. Look at, whoa, this is so astonishing what we can achieve. Look at the value that we're bringing in this world. It's just, wow, out of this world. Would you believe if I told you this many weeks ago, this month, that we could accomplish this? Wow. So that to me is what adaptive oversight uh, is about unleashing in ourselves the belief, um, the possibility um, that we can create way better when we join up with, with one another like that. But to make that happen, we need to get really, really good at practicing courage and managing safety really, really well. Because um, without safety, if it's unsafe for me to speak up and say, uh, you know what, guys, I'm not really all that good at this. I don't get it. Um, please help me understand. If I'm not willing or if it's harmful uh, to me or my career to admit any kind of vulnerability, then I'm in trouble. Yeah, because I can't learn anything. And if it's expected by everybody that I already know everything, um, then we're again in fundamental trouble. So we must cultivate um, genuine psychological uh, safety. And that involves not only including people in our uh, conversations, but also learning from one another. And most critically for a genuine, uh, not just um, learner and collaborator safety, but challenger safety. In other words, like Adam Grant calls it, cultivate a challenge network. Make sure that when you have an idea, you share it with people and say, hey, help me fix this. What am I missing? What am I not noticing? Deliberately, actively challenge your perspective and your idea through dialogue so that we keep each other sane. We, we go, oh, right, that's awesome, but you are missing this. In other words, we give each other the gift of oversight because we're not saying, oh, no, I got it. Leave it with me. It's sorted. It's like, here's where I got to. What else? Yeah. So having the, the willingness to say what else, well, that requires courage. That requires practicing courage. That requires, particularly for people in position of authority, modeling courage and making it so that when you say something, people don't kind of aggressively jump into some form of cancellation attempt, looking at the surface interpretation of what the words were, as opposed to understanding the intent of what people have. Yeah. Okay, now... Um, Around optimizing utilization and flow, those are, are fairly um, clear. If I want to optimize utilization, I want to have people 100% utilized. Yeah, but there's an inconvenient piece of math called queuing theory that shows us that as soon as you kind of go higher up than about 80% or so in utilization, you start to get into trouble. You get, start to get stuck. So not so good to have too much utilization. You want to have good utilization, but not just maximum. And then flow, well, for flow, you need all sorts of other uh, clever ways of thinking about, uh, look at the work of um, Eli Goldratt, you know, theory of constraints and so on. There's a lot of really great stuff um, to understand in that space. So balancing these two is actually really fascinating as well. And um, essentially what we're doing with this is we're saying there is 
why we call this a galaxy is because imagine you look from above our solar system, right? There's a star in the middle and there are some planets kind of orbiting around and there's a Goldilocks zone where it's not too hot, it's not too cold. You can have nice kind of liquid water on the surface of the planet. It's kind of just neat, just right for life to, to flourish, right? So the intention of this graphic is to say somewhere between control and trust, somewhere between the agile and iron triangle, somewhere between safety and courage, there's a Goldilocks zone. And we have a range of, of techniques, of approaches where we can help facilitate the discovery of what these Goldilocks zones are. We can look at what warning signs we might see and what specific interventions and actions we might take in order to define and achieve steps towards that win-win, uh, towards that synergy. So um, I'll open um, uh, this um, presentation to questions from uh, the rest of the audience. Um, what piques your interest? What else um, would you like to, to learn from Davi and us? And what would you like to explore about this? I'd like to get Davi's take on this. Um, since he's our guest, uh, on, uh, guest speaker today, um, I'd like to um, get his take on it. I think it's very useful to have a have a, a framework within which to, um, if you will, reference our observations of where organizations are at any particular point. Um, I think we also need to keep in mind that, um, and this is quite common when we when we do adopt or when we do go towards the the more more adaptive agile style of working, is that the the killer of credibility uh, is unpredictability. And in many of our frameworks, what we need to also acknowledge is that um, flow and utilization might not necessarily be opposite to each other, um, because in many places, um, we are willing to, willing to compromise on utilization in order to get predictability, but that might, doesn't necessarily infer a state of flow. It's the old uh, mythical man month thing, right, is throw more people at it and, and solve it within reason. Um, so certainly we do want to see a measure there of the fact that critical to running an organization, especially in a place where uh, external deadlines are set, such as from, from whatever regulators and the like, um, we have to also be able to somehow create predictability in outcomes. Um, and that very often comes across as, as milestone-based work, it does. Um, but I have seen it very successfully applied when working back from the from the risks we're trying to address to get to the deadline forward um, towards that deadline, rather than just the, the classic flow based, we'll just pull some stories off the backlog and your stuff will get done when it's done because I can't tell you when because we're agile, so you just have to wait, uh, which is a, which is an undesirable uh, state for any executive trying to run a business uh, to be in. So I'll, I'll just leave that there. Thank you, Dolby. Um we have you seen in, in your career, and we've asked you for uh, examples um, where some of these elements <laughs> has come into play and, and um, how do organizations usually handle this, this, mm. uh, this, this tension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a, a conversation I often have with my, with my 14 year old daughter who teaches me more things on a daily basis than, than virtually my entire career. Um, is, the, is the importance of the point of observation, i.e. different people are looking at the same thing from different places and not only do they, but often they need to see it differently. Um, and that means uh, in this context that be, being on the inside of the triangle with the need for control and the use of the iron triangle, et cetera, um, does not preclude us from also being able to operate the others if what we actually need to understand is how do we articulate the inner ring of, of, of interpretation regardless of how we operate. Now that again sounds a little bit obtuse, um, but a great conversation I had once with our group CEO many years ago was he had a very, he loved the concept of an agile organization and, and he firmly believed that the agile organization needs to look exactly the same everywhere the word agile is used. Um, which is a complete anti-pattern. And the debate I had with him at the time was, 
uh, we certainly can standardize to that point where everybody does it exactly the same, but who are we standardizing for? Mm. Are we standardizing for the work or are we standardizing for you? And if we're standardizing for you, then the level at which we standardize needs to be much higher up in the organization than the work. But if we're standardizing for the work, then we standardize on the ground. And we know that that's a, that's a variable outcome approach um, in the beginning. So we should also understand that at different levels of the hierarchy, we need to be able to represent our work in the manner and the language of the inner circle, even if we actually deliver the work entirely in the manner of the outer circle. Very good observation there. Thank you. That's really excellent. Um, another question that I wanted to ask you is um, this uh, tension between exploring and innovating um, and then balancing that with somebody pulling on the handbrake so that you don't go, go too far off at the tangent with your exploration and innovation. Um, what are the, uh, the, the, the key uh, ideas or the key um, experiences that you've seen between that tension? Um, yeah. Um, so let's let's talk about about innovation. Innovation has also had been a, a well used term over the over the decades, and uh, in some forms, innovation is is the theater of having a a human centered design garage where people can go and they can get innovated upon. Um, but my definition of innovation is actually having having our people equipped and knowledgeable. Uh, in the profession that they that they live and work and and have enough insight into the problems of the firm or the client or the market and the time to apply the one to the other without distraction. You know, those are the conditions for for innovation. And innovation in and of itself has to be towards the purpose of the firm in one way or another. Uh, sometimes innovation is the excuse for a free for all. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want for 20% of my time. Uh, you know, I'm going to start a pet walking service when we're in financial services or whatever the case may be. And that's not, that's not, that's not desirable innovation because if you do want to create a pet walking service and no, no disrespect to them, because I value mine highly, um, then, you know, perhaps you should consider a career change and go and do that. But if you're innovating on a new and exciting way in which we can serve our customers, or in which we can uh, operate in the market, whatever the case may be, uh, then that is useful innovation. And, and absolutely, we have to create the space and the time for that. So I'm of the school that says, um, the direction of your innovation has to be in the direction of the organizational purpose and vision and value and, and, and outcome. Because otherwise it's not innovation, otherwise it's screwing around on someone else's time. Gloria. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, the storm is um, is just astonishing. Uh, it's moved from Aldo to to my neck of the woods, and it's just uh, very very loud. That's why I kept on mute. Um, I know this is a tough question, um, but um, what do you reckon we're missing? Is there anything that uh, you look at and it kind of jumps at you and think, yeah, but you haven't thought about X. <laughs> I, I did mention uh, the concept of, of predictability uh, mm. is, is important to think about. I, I think that some of the some of the polarities um, might not be direct polar polarities; they might be oblique polarities. Um, yeah. Things such yeah. as the polarity between personal interest and organizational purpose mm -hmm. um, is comes feels very black and white. Um, and, and I think that there is, a, there, is a, there is a whole universe of shade between what actual true personal interest means and what organizational uh, purpose means. I also think that the, uh, as another example, is the, is the there is a, a third leg to trust and control. Hmm. Uh, and, I, and this is going to sound very hippie when I say it, but I think the third leg is belief. And that belief is not necessarily in the fact, it's not the trust that things are working and it's the belief that things can work i think is the third leg of that as a as a triangle and that belief that things can or could work that is the part where we 
try things and we learn things and we prove things together that creates the trust and manifests the control. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, that's something that uh, we didn't explain um, sufficiently clearly that these are, are not intended to be seen as, as linear. Um, sure. Sure. Sort of, sure. um, it's like a, a piston moving just uh, front to back. Uh, yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> but very much a, a, a general suite of, um, of influences that mm. need, uh, need attention. It's more yeah. a way of framing challenges. Yeah, I like the framing. I think it's a very useful frame. Mm. Could do with a bit of a graphic artist, though, there, not to, not to get. <laughs> oh, <yet>. yeah. <laughs> we've, we've accepted that from the, from the get go. Need, hey, need someone with some crayons there, man. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Make it, uh, make it pretty. Uh, and if I could make it less wordy, I'd, I'd do so as well. But that's the trouble. There, there's so much stuff to, to pay attention to and consider. It's, it's really challenging, isn't it? I think it's a very, a very useful uh, thinking tool mm. um, to contextualize what you're observing in a firm. Yeah. Um, some of the things that came through quite uh, heavy with uh, the research that we've done was a lot to do with human behavior uh, around these, not necessarily the practices uh, and techniques. It was a, a lot of it has got to do with human behavior. And that surprised me as well. Um, in, in many respects. Um, so like I've explained earlier, the, uh, the, the basis of how people manifest their fears and how they act on fear came through quite strong um, in, in all of these things. So there were quite a lot of recurring themes about beha fear-based behaviors. Um, so we, we when we did the research, we had... Uh, I don't know how many we had about 38 sessions in total with people from all over the world where we put this in front of them and um, asked them what do they think and um, how, how do they see certain aspects of these tensions play out uh, and so on. Um, it was really, uh, <laughs> we've got hours and hours of recordings. Um, so Again, this is more a combination of their contribution as well. It's not just us sitting in isolation and sucking this out of our thumbs. No, very valuable. I certainly enjoy it. I'll be, I'll be giving it a bit of thought over time too. Very good. Um, we, can, we can get you uh, access to the deeper detail if you've got time. But um, oh, That would be wonderful. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. There's a question here from uh, uh, Andreas. Um, he loves it. And then he's wondering is the mm. perspective towards the environment, i.e. Uh, perceiving market shifts, disruptions, and reaction to, to those versus driving the existing business model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the OODA loop for strategy, in other words, yeah. where it's a very good pickup. And, and I wonder if that doesn't live, live somewhere between the organizational purpose um, leg and the explore and innovate leg some somehow that's a very it's a very good pickup actually yeah. is Thank that we you. don't we don't actually address the firm's ability to observe uh orient etc so if, if i if i may give a little bit of extra sort of background where where i'm sort of coming from with this uh so for those who don't know me i'm an academic and i recently had one a research paper to review who did an in-depth literature analysis and the major takeaway was this um, agile or this uh, scaled agile thing has one novel thing and the, that's the speed with which to sense and react to the market so this is very in internally focused from what I see and that's sort of what has sort of triggered me is this novel unique perspective with this uh, speed in sensing uh, what, what, what happens on the market is this, is this in there that's certainly the promise uh, Andreas um... The reality often, though, is that the, the implementation and, and practice and use of these scaled agile frameworks very often forgets that that's the purpose and becomes self-referencing self, self in, in, its, in its own uh, maturity journey, um, as opposed to measuring itself by exactly that, abil that ability to be truly agile. So I think you're onto a very important point that is, might be implied in the frameworks, but in reality, most often is missing. 
part of that is also covered in the agile triangle because it talks about value delivery and why would you keep delivering something if it's not bringing in value or yeah. providing yeah. value um so wanting feedback in other words and the feedback might well be market conditions yeah but good pickup thank you very much andreas mm. very good okay Horia, any other questions well um I'm really curious to hear um, Dawi's thoughts on where next um, in this realm of oversight. What would be some areas to consider or habits to practice or just um, thoughts to explore? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've, I've, I've come full circle uh, back to where as a, as a organizational leader, I'm, I'm almost going back to the shoe on purpose. Um, you've heard me say the word or the words first principles a number of times and, and where I am with the firm, the firm that I have the pleasure of serving in now is very much in the space of, of, the, of the incremental improvement towards the strategic outcomes rather than the adoption of the frame um, for the teams. Um, and it's some interesting observations. There, there are many that, that want the frame. Uh, but by no means a majority. Um, and I think that depends on having a level of, of, of education, of awareness, um, of knowledge of how these things could or should work um, as a level of competence in the firm is very valuable because then the, the, the iteration towards that outcome is inherent in the way that we operate rather than a thing that we do to adopt a, a method. Um, so I'm very much back in the back in the space of the let's observe, let's see the problem, let's understand the options and techniques available to us, let's try one and see how we go, building the 1% improvement on the other. Uh, and what I have observed is that um, that is having startlingly fast results um, because we're fortunately not encumbered by the, by the perception of not being allowed slash able to change things because it is our our published doctrine. We don't have a published doctrine. So the team can do what the team needs to do to solve the problem that they have at hand. Um, and as I say, the results are quite startling. Yeah. yeah. Einstein uh, once said that the, the biggest force in the world is compound interest. And that's the, if you compound exactly. 1% thinking, that's, that's compound interest of that 1% thinking. That's exactly right, and and it's not and it's not one percent without some kind of framing of how we articulate that one percent because that's quite important that one can actually feel, see, hear, learn from the the iteration, which is why we adopt the the three product language, is so that we can understand that the that the very small potentially incremental change or improvement is to the product itself or the customer or the customer experience or the economic outcome. Um, and or to the method or the, the techniques or, or that by which we achieve that and or to the way that we behave and preferably to all three of them. But it's quite important that we understand that we're intentional about applying the small changes to those three dimensions. Mm. I, I have a detailed question about that, Darby. Um, sure. One thing I come across when I work with teams is this phenomenon of hidden work. So you talk about those, those three elements of the of work um how much uh do you notice uh, the prevalence of hidden work because mm. go governance or oversight gone rampant provides quite a lot of hidden work mm. yeah that's right um and and that is that is true in all organizations and what we're working hard on is to ensure that there is no there is no there is no um, categorization of work. Work is work because we only have so much time and, and so many cycles in each of us to get through things. And being really frank with ourselves, when, when work comes in that, uh, you know, we, in order to manage the whip, if we bring something in, something has to stop. And, and that's a hard conversation in the beginning, but it's a muscle that we're, we are practicing. We're not good at it yet, but we'll get there. Uh, and there is a wide understanding in the firm that this is necessary. Mm. Um, especially in a time where you know the we've just come off the heydays of booming markets 
uh, and booming economies, interestingly, through the through the pandemics. And that's changing. And the the scarcity, the realization that there is there is potential real scarcity is real. Uh, and and hence we can't just throw more people at the problem uh, because that creates other problems down the way as we encumber ourselves in a way that then reduces our ability to respond when the markets do turn. So the ability for us to acknowledge all work as work is a muscle that we're certainly practicing. Uh, and often the most important word that you can say in that space is no. Mm. The first time is always the hardest. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, and, you know, in the spirit of radical candor, um, the most important thing that you can do is be, is be upfront and clear about things mm. rather, than, rather, than to, uh, rather than to smile and nod and create a whole bunch of expectations that will just be let down later. Uh, and that will most probably come at the, at the cost of the well-being of the folks that we're putting under unreasonable pressure. Yeah, that's a really interesting aspect. So one of the things that Kim um, doesn't quite emphasize enough, I believe, in her work on radical candor is um, if you look at just the graph, it says care personally, right? So the, mm -hmm. the northern direction in that diagram is about care personally. But it's not just about I personally care about X. It's more... I care personally about us achieving a really great outcome together. Yes, so correct. So it's, it's an altruistic orientation that says, yeah. I don't just care about me. I also care about you. And I mm -hmm. also care about us achieving great things together. In other words, not at my expense, right? It was like, oh, I'm so, um, you know, a virtue signaling that uh, I'm so uh, sort of giving of myself. Look at me, how much I'm suffering. And so no, no, none of that. Yeah. Um, right. You want to get genuine win-win, but that mm -hmm. will only happen if you practice the courage to speak up and say, ah, I'm not sure about that one, because mm. that's, that's going to hurt you. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And, and you know, I've, I've yet to be in a commercial business, i.e. a business that actually has a profit motive, uh, where the organizational purpose is just to have a happy bunch of people turning up at the same place every day. <laughs> mm. Well, this is where uh, guys like um, Corporate Rebels uh, and um, um, Gary Hamill in his Humanocracy kind of point at. There are some outfits around the globe that are they're making good strides in, in that direction. But you're absolutely right. Yep. It's, it's not um, sort of common habit just yet. We can, we can only hope. That's yeah. right. That's right. And as long as the, as long as the motive for, for profit and for stakeholder and shareholder return is there, um, we have to also honor that because right. that gives us the license to operate in the organizations we're in. That's right. That's right. And it's perfectly understandable. That's why I'm saying it has to be a win-win, not just, okay, let's tear down this whole um, money-making idea and replace it with something else. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I, how's that going to work better? I, I used to love showing up as the, uh, as the rebel without a cause. Um, that was a fairly defining characteristic of mine growing up and in my early career. Uh, and, and it had the upside of, 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 the, um, of the irreverence of the organization and of the governance and control that comes with that um, and a, a, should we call it, implied tolerance of doing things outside of the norm because, hey, he's just, he's just the, the rebel. Um, but there does come a time when you go from being the rebel to being the custodian. That's right. Mm. And then you have to think about it a little bit differently because then you do need rebels within your custody. Uh, but you also have to look after the after the um, the overall system uh, and the license for us all to operate that comes from being within that system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So um, I'd like to offer um, an invitation in closing that um, any of the uh, audience members are more than welcome to reach out to us and say, hey, uh, I like this topic too. Um, I'd like to, to have a chat with you guys um, as you've seen us have a chat with Dali um, earlier today. So uh, we're looking forward to your, your thoughts and contributions. We'd be delighted to have you as um, interviewees on the Focus uh, podcast. Um, Davi, uh, deep, heartfelt thanks for your uh, willingness to, um, to spend some time with us. It's deeply appreciated. Um, I have uh, made it a note to reach out and confirm with you some time that you will have available, and I'll walk you through um, 
our sort of broader uh, research findings and, and insights. Um, and with that, um, I'll hand over to Aldo to, to close us up. Thank you very much again, uh, Davi. It was good to have you on the call. Um, I'm glad that your South African accent didn't come too strong, uh, come through too strongly. And I can make mine a lot stronger if you want to, but uh, thank you for your time. Um, we really appreciate this. So the whole intention behind this podcast series is to explore this domain with practitioners such as yourself and actually make that available and start conversations out there in, in the universe so that um, we can get better situations, better work situations for people um, so that we can move towards more engagement and actually get people to live their ikigais a lot better um, or more effectively. Um, thank you everybody for attending and thanks for your contributions. Um, this is the focus. Um, I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. As a reminder, um, we'll notify you when the recording becomes available. Uh, you should see uh, a note in the next few days. Um, the Focus podcast will be available very soon, and this will be one of our episodes. Thank you very much, everybody.